July 13th, 2018. This is Joey Balfour with the National World War II Museum, and I'm here today with, could you introduce yourself, please? My name is Albert Joseph Fabulich, but I'd rather go by the name of Al. And when and where were you born, Mr. Al? I was born with great difficulty to my mother as a breech birth that started out very sad note. Nevertheless, I had a wonderful life. I was born in Manhattan, low east side, poor section of Manhattan Island in New York City. I was born October 15th, 1925, with the help of a midwife. My mother had no money and uh, she needed help. So there I was starting my life with great difficulty to my mother. I never had any brothers or sisters. That was sad because I didn't grow up with toys on the floor. I sort of grew up as a tiny little adult. That made my whole perspective of my life and those around me kind of different. We had no money, so we, well, I, I learned the efficiency of my mother, born in Yugoslavia, before it was called Yugoslavia, when she was born in 1900, there were sort of non-descriptive kingdoms instead of the word country. So I was told she was born in Hrvatska, which means it's a Slavic word that means our area, ours. So that starts off with a bit of confusion. Nevertheless, there I was born and my mother nursed me until I was, what, probably close to two years of age. We had no other child food and the steaks and we never ate. So it was always big pieces of simple food and meats and fish and, and vegetables. And vegetable was a big thing in my life. My mother was uh, never trained in cooking. She was born near the town of, on a tiny island of Lazaret in the Adriatic Sea, close to what we call the city of, of uh, Zadar. And that was a, a, a very big city in the, in, in the Roman days. And nearby there was the first Colosseum, not in Rome, built not too far from there. I've seen pictures of it, I've never been in it. Anyway, there I was born, being brought up, speaking Slavic, not knowing anything else. And uh, when I got of age to go down from my fourth floor walk up, I was sent to the streets, not knowing English, but I learned the bad words first. I would come up and teach my mother all these bad words, never knowing what they meant, and wasn't interested in asking. So anyway, there was little Al being raised in Manhattan, and a short time later my father got a job from his cousin in Woodside, Queens, Long Island. As you know, New York City had counties, but they were incorporated into the city, so they became renamed boroughs. So then the five counties became five boroughs, and we were in the borough of Queens, next to Brooklyn, across the river from Manhattan. So we, my father got this job working for his cousin with a Chrysler agency. In those days, that was a prized job because that was in the middle of the, of the Depression and money was scarce and he was glad to get any penny or any dollar. So he learned how to paint cars. My father was a spray painter with lacquer paint. That meant very thin coats, 25 coats of lacquer, and then stand it. But they were using early 3M sandpaper, 
and you didn't use water, it would weaken the glue. They used gasoline, which didn't. And that, those fumes made him look like he was drunk all the time, but he wasn't. So there we were, day after day, year after year, growing up with this Sunday soup lasting all week, and my father working. At some point, sticking with my father's story, he said that they were coming in with a new paint. Instead of 25 coats during the Depression, that was an introduction by DuPont Company, he said, to have a one coat, I don't know if it's epoxy base or something else, but it was a one coat paint. And you cleaned the car, you sprayed it, and it, it dried shiny and thick, and it, he was almost out of a job. But nevertheless, he kept working. He kept working for my cousin. And at some point, he, instead of money, he was allowed to buy from his cousin a rumble seat Ford, which was the, 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 the joy of, of many of us. But that was in lieu of salary. And my mother didn't work, so she started to earn a few cents. She would iron men's business white shirts for a penny a piece. My poor mother would work any, it was piecework, so she learned how to, to, to get up early and go to work and, and, and work until late to bring home more money. And little by little, my father advanced within that painting type of, of, of this epoxy type or one coat type of paint. So that's what happened until at some future year, my father was sick, found out that he wasn't, he was breathing, but he couldn't get any oxygen. His body was short of oxygen because he never learned how to use a mask. That was not thought of to save the health of workers. And he didn't join a union. It was no union, it was just working for his cousin. So life was difficult for us because when he was sick, he couldn't work. And when he couldn't work, he didn't bring any money home that week. So we lived through my father's illness, which was uh, uh, intermittent, and my mother's cooking, and, and my starting to go to kindergarten. And as I went to kindergarten in Woodside, Queens, Public School 11, that was my school. PS 11, we called it. And PS 11 was a good neighbor school, except it was like 10 blocks away from our home. We lived in the attic of my father's employer, his cousin, who bought this old, old, 100-year-old house with a gigantic attic. So with very little bit of money, my father's employer slightly remodeled the attic, cold as hell, and adequate. We had a little tiny gas coil water heater. Otherwise, the water was ice cold. We had no insulation. I had my own bedroom. I had four or five blankets. I had ice on the window in my bedroom in the middle of winter because of my, my, the moisture in my breath. I couldn't see through the windows. I didn't really care. I didn't have anything to look at. Nevertheless, we survived that too. Summers were equally hot as were the winters cold. So we continued with this plan. So when my father was getting medication, the first thing they said was, you've got to stop working. We've got to find another job. So he, got a, he had a temporary job at the end of the Depression working in an aircraft factory on Long Island. So meanwhile, I was being educated 
and I was getting double A's everywhere with my mother's technique, getting good grades, wanting so strongly to learn as much as I could so I would teach her. And I developed my own technique, kind of. She would say, what's this word? We call it Connecticut. So I told her, no, that's Connecticut. And I showed her how to divide the word into letters that were resembling a, 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 a syllable. And so she learned restaurant in the same way. And many other words, she actually learned how to read a newspaper years later by this technique without any schooling. She had to go to some schools to get uh, naturalization papers. They wouldn't let her just get naturalization papers without learning something about the country. So she had to learn a little bit of English and I wasn't allowed to be there with her. So I just did my best to prepare her for this test. What about your dad? Did your, your dad spoke Slavic or was he Slavic? He was, okay. My dad was born also in the island off of the city of Zadar. The Zadar is one of the places where the Romans visited from the so-called Italian peninsula, which never was a country until 18, 19, uh, 1870. Okay, my dad went to school for six years until his father died in World War I. My father's name was Nicholas. And we called him, I mean, everybody else called him Nick. That's what he was known as, N-I-C-K, Nick Fabulich. So he, going through sixth grade, was never a perfect student. He was never motivated. He was always hungry. And one word stuck in his mind, which he taught me many times, in which I have a long story. I have a fig tree in my side yard, I'll show you, that he brought from Hollywood, which he brought from Woodside, Queens, which he broke off a branch from a neighbor's fig tree. It, that fig variety is called brown turkey. That was sweet and purplish, but called brown turkey, about the size of an apricot. On rare occasion, with, <clears throat> with well-fertilized ground, you could get one as big as a pear, a Bartlett pear. Unusual. Okay, so that word fig was, was developed strongly in his mind because in his town of Preko, P-R-E-K-O, on the island of Oglan, U-G-L-J-A-N, just a short distance off of the main Adriatic coast. Main Adriatic coast is, has very little organic matter. Therefore, the water in the Adriatic there is, is very clear, very deep, so they can catch fish more easily. And they, I was told, the fish is healthier because it's just rocks and clear water. And so when he was a little boy, he only had, in the poverty, and they had, his father had made a, a fig tree grow. And when his father went to war and got, got killed in World War I, he, my father, had to protect the fig tree. That was food. That was not only delicious, it was healthy, and it was extremely precious in their minds. So therefore, that stuck with my father, and he transfer that to me. That's the story of the fig tree, which I can show you the results in the side yard later. My father was never well educated. He wasn't interested in that. He smoked a lot, drank as much wine as he could find anywhere. He would work for somebody who had grapes in the town of Preko, P-R-E-K-O, and he would always drink as much on the job as he could find. So therefore, he transferred that knowledge of making wine into Woodside, Queens, 
when we lived in his cousin's house. We had a huge cellar, about 20 feet high. And we had this 100-gallon barrels and 50-gallon barrels and 25-gallon barrels, which have been used in a distillery and were very good open to allow the grapes to be fermented. So we had a period every year my father would play like a king and, and, and advertise his knowledge of picking a recipe of different kinds of grapes to make the best wine. There was Alegante, Zinfandel. The names, I used to know all of, all of the names of all the grapes. We would grind grapes in the cellar and we would wait until the grapes were, were fermenting, never to touch anything. And because the, the mash would dry, it would lift off of the liquid. And we never, never touched the barrels because it would make the wine uh, sour. So we had a spigot in the bottom, and my father says, okay. But he was teaching me the art of making, of choosing the grapes, grinding the grapes. And there I was, a little kid, five years old and, and older, trying to grind, and he would put his hand on mine, and we would grind these grapes in a wooden hopper, about 24 inches by 24 inches, angled. And so we're grinding these grapes into the barrel. When the time came, usually a week or so later, my father would see that the, the mash would start falling, and that was a critical time to don't touch the mash because it would go down in the liquid the wine. So we would tap the wine, and he always allowed me a little tiny sip of what we call first wine. And first wine was the most potent and was most treasured and would last longer. So we would drain the wine, put it in one, another barrel, and we would take the four inch of, of mash off the top and save that for making red wine vinegar. And then we would add hot water and a little bit of brown sugar and all the various barrels would be collected and all mixed and then allowed to settle. And the bacteria would start reproducing or would start converting the grapes and sugar to alcohol and we would make delicious red wine vinegar. Then, after that was out, we would throw away the, the mesh that was dry, that was on top, and we would we have a distillery, a little tank and a coil surrounded by water, and the, the tank, we would boil the mesh, and the vapors would go up through, through this coil, and liquid 200 proof whiskey would come out of the mash. After we had taken all the sour mash away and had just the best of the mash. So that was a quick memory of making wine, making red wine vinegar, and making, uh, making brandy. In the brandy, he bought some more barrels which were charred on the inside and we would put the pure alcohol. Of course, at one point when we kept testing the strength of the alcohol, what do they call that, hygrometer or something like that, but we tested the alcohol and when it came too low, we stopped, we didn't save anymore, but we put that pure colorless alcohol into these charred small, like 25-gallon barrels, so that the char would give them color. And my father said to take the impurities out, take the poisons out, whatever that meant. So that's the story of the, of the making of the processed grape juice. Coming back, I was continuing, continuing my education getting A's, doing well, being happy, being proud, my mother being very proud. She always showed me how much she loved me with hugs always, and I still do that myself today. She told me that a handshake 
it's okay when you want to talk to a dog. But she said, the way to show a person that you enjoy being with them, talking and listening to them, and being around them, is to give them a hug. Nothing sexual, just a plain, sincere, long hug. Not just a quickie, millisecond, but, you know, two or three seconds. That showed that you were glad to be with them. That made them happy. So then that was the art of hugging that I still do to this day. At, when I was about four, four and a half, something like that, we came across a used Victrola, a tall box about 24 by 24 by four feet tall, brown mahogany, I guess. And it, would, it was a RCA Victor Victrola. You would wind it up, and wind up the spring somehow, and you would put the needle on the 78 record, and it would turn until the spring was a month. And we loved to listen to what we call Yugoslav or Hrvatska songs and music. One particular instrument that was very popular was called, in English, the mandolin. But in, in Slavic, it's called a tamburica. T-A-M-B-U-R-I-C-A, tamburica. That particular um, instrument is carried on to this day in Duquesne University in Pennsylvania. There are a lot of Slavic people in that part of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, still there, and they travel with the Tamburosa band. I don't know how many, but quite a few players, women and men, and usually they wear these costumes. The men would wear uh, colorful scarves and, and a top a shirt. Now the women wore, wore skirts, and they were trying to connect coordinate the women's skirts with a particular village that had an emblem, that had a design. Particular villages in Yugoslavia or Hrvatska had designs. Each village trained their women to try to, I don't know what you call it, uh, they would crisscross X's and, and, and they would embroider different nice designs into the skirts which, which ad, uh, identified them with a certain village. Was that, was that a, a family? Uh, no, said, it was no, no, a no, village. No, 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 no. <clears throat> you said that you liked listening to the music. Was that something you and your family did together? A, the, uh, the current continuation of the, of the uh, culture. B, actually the culture itself came up with these skirts for women in, in Croatia. Actually, it wasn't called Croatia at that time. It was called Dalmatia at one point. The kings got together and called themselves an area of Dalmatia. Dalmatia in Slavic. Anyway, so the original customs were continued into America as immigrants came here, such as uh, Pennsylvania and other places. In fact, my name, Fabulich, is, has been known to be in, in, the, in the western uh, area. So we have immigrants from that area with my name, and I don't even know them. Of course, I can, I can make a search, but the name Fabulich which doesn't have an H. You see, most, uh, I learned that most uh, name endings are significant. Like in Italy, a lot of names end in I. And so I was told that that means in a family of, possessive. And so it is with itch. It's a, a possessive in maybe the original hundreds of years ago or 2000, when the Romans were in that area, 
it, it had to do with Fabuloso or some kind of a name uh, starting with Fabu. So anyway, uh, many of my relatives and parents came to this country in Ellis Island, New York, with the name Fabulich, with a check mark on top of the C, indicating you pronounce that C with a CH sound. And the SH and CH checks, I learned how to interpret them so I would pronounce the names correctly. SH would, I mean, an S with a check would be an SH sound. So our name was Fabulich with a C. Those Fabuliches who went to Chicago changed their names to Fabulich with a K. So if you find the name Fabulich, which I have relatives in, in, in Chicago, their names are all ending in K, F-A-B-U-L-I-C-K. So that's the name story. As we came back, my father was getting uh, ill, more ill, and he was losing more time at work. So he, he stayed home for a while, and the doctor says, you have to change your job. So therefore, he got a job in air, aircraft, some simple job in the aircraft factories, which started in the Long Island area. Uh, Grumman, or one of those airplane factories, was started in, in, to make early planes. I don't know, maybe with the Chinese or Eastern area. But anyway, he was doing some riveting for a while. My mother never got a job. She was always home encouraging me. I started to go to uh, junior uh, high school, and because we were on the farm, 40 miles from New York City, we had school buses. And the earliest school buses started collecting kids further out. East Northport, Long Island, there are three counties in Long Island, actually more if you include uh, Queens and Brooklyn. But the first buses would pick us up. We moved to East Northport, where my father didn't work anymore in, in the area of Woodside, Queens. So he bought an old potato farm to retire and die at. But he lasted a long time. So there we were in transition, so to speak. There we were, moving to the potato farm. Old, hundred-year-old house, two-story, two-bedroom, no inside bathroom, just an inside pump for water in the kitchen. And that brought water from a cistern, which is a concrete tank in the ground, covered over, so wouldn't have too much dust or, or dirt come in. And we would collect rain on the roof of this old, old house and into gutters and into pipes into the cistern. So that was our water. No heat, no hot water. So we remembered being in Woodside, we had a coil, gasoline, to make hot water. So we tried to put that out in the farm, but we didn't have any gas pipes, and we didn't have any, any, any tanks, propane tanks. And we didn't even know about that, really. So we had cold water all year for a while. And little by little, we tried to make modernization. So... I don't want to digress too far, but the, the point is we, we lived with what we had. And we learned to, to cope in bed at night with more and more blankets, barely exposing our noses, seeing the ice on the window, and waiting for the morning to melt it off. Usually it's the heat of our bodies that would raise the temperature of the room to give us some hope. But there were some really, really cold nights. So we started to 
put more sweaters on, as well as the blankets, and we learn how to laugh. At least we're alive, my mother would say. So she had an attitude. Attitude became a very important word in my, my whole life, even today. I learned to appreciate. I learned to respect. I learned to do the best I could with what I had, but look for opportunities to improve. So while we were being collected by the school buses out in the boondocks, 40 miles away from New York, but only about 10 miles away from our school, I was one of the first ones off the bus, ran to the gym, and we acquired a 45. Most people don't know what a 45 record player is, but we did. We didn't own one, but the school had one. And they acquired some, some little, I don't know, six or seven inch diameter platters of some good Western music and good dance music, cowboy stuff, a lot of. And so because my mother taught me how to dance early, I continued that in the family activities. And so when I came off the bus and I ran to the gym, Guess what? I had a lineup of, of teenage girls waiting for me to dance with them. Now that was the key of my life, besides coming home to my mother and say, what did we learn today, Sonny? I had a good life. That established my good attitude, I think. I didn't have too many fears except doing something that made my mother cry or doing something that made her sad. I didn't want her ever to lose, lose love of, lose her love. I think that's a fear we all have. <laughs> well, it was real, and yet it was easily cured. All I had to do was be good, learn, dance, and she paid for my tambourine lessons. They actually bought a used tambourine, which is like a, a flat mandolin. Normally, the, the, the word mandolin is a belly mandolin. It's an instrument with the four strings, but a belly. And it had a different sound than a flat, cheaper instrument. So, I came back and I would dance one girl after the other. Nothing romantic, nothing unusual, just happiness. And it was healthy because I learned... The, the importance of exercise, and little by little, my father allowed me to use my knowledge of raising poultry so that he would let me have an old, old barn that came with the farm and convert it with some carpenter help. He paid for the carpenter, and we actually changed some of the windows and changed some the stairs up to the second floor, the, the, the hay area. So I was able to eventually get what we call a 500 lot of baby chicks, one day old baby chicks. And as I learned in the school, you, you have to have a rotation of crops. And as one a group of chicks is growing up, you buy another 500 and you have succeeding levels of maturity. And then at some point, dwelling on the chicks now, I learned how to separate the male from the female. You couldn't do it except an expert be, could do it because the, a bird has only one vent. And it's waste and eggs in the same exit, the bird's body in the same vent. So the bird's body is a production line inside. It has an ovary. She's female. She has a, like a bunch of grapes, each egg drops into the funnel, fallopian tube. And that gets processed like a General Motors production line. It gets rotated as it's cl getting closer to the vent, and it gets squirted with liquid uh, calcium that the bird produces. And, and that calcium 
and the, and the shalazer, that's the little kind of a sack, and a little different parts. The, the yolk is the center of the egg, which comes from the ovary, and it gets coated with albumin, and eventually, uh, I don't want to drag this out, but actually that wet, roly-poly ball is coming close to the vent, at which some of the oxygen, some of the air solidifies the calcium. And when you are friendly with a bird, they lay eggs right in your hand. And when the, when the bird lays, when those chickens, no, I would always talk with them, and they would cackle to back to me. So when, they, when I approached them and they lay an egg in my hand, there was a kind of a skin-type membrane, still soft, slightly wet, and the calcium was starting to solidify as it got more air, and it dropped in my hand as a wet kind of a toy ball with, with a, like a plastic flexible cover, but within two, three, three seconds, it was solid. I don't know if you ever had... I, I have felt fresh eggs like that. I mean, right in your hand. I've never had a chicken lay one in my hand. Ah, oh, you got you got to be in love, we see. She's got to love you. <laughs> the chickens uh, are healthier, I, I learned and found, when they're happy. Whether you play music or whether you talk to them, they're happier knowing that you're there. And they know you when you walk in. They'll cackle like crazy. They're not fearful. They're happy. Now, so anyway. Well, how old were you uh, about this time? Okay. I was born in 1925. I was... Uh, I, I was... I would believe... Uh, I, I think I was about... Ten. Okay. I believe we started to develop a raising of the poultry later. I didn't go to I didn't go to animal husbandry school until I graduated high school, which was in forty one. See, I didn't go there, so I didn't know anything about the the art of raising poultry. We just had chickens. And dog, a cat. We just had chicken. So I'm differentiating the, you know, the, the, the expertise that I didn't have uh, later. Okay, so that was the story of, uh, oh, I'll, I'll continue the chicken story because that's part of my life. Uh, I was, my father had a 39 business group, huge back truck, uh, blue. And I would, I bought a rotating drum with fingers sticking out so that we would process the birds as they became uh, mature. The, the males matured about eight weeks and the female is called pullet. The male is called cockerel, C-O-C-K-R-E-L. So the females would just cackle and eat and grow slowly. And they <clears throat> were not the first to be slaughtered. The males were slaughtered because if you slaughter them early enough, they're big and, and, and they're tender. If you wait too long, there was a period where they, their muscles started working and they start jumping on the pullet. So you separate them early <clears throat> so they wouldn't be so active. But, but sometimes if you had too many and the space was too small, they would start eating, picking at each other. <clears throat> so that started what they call cannibalism because in some birds who mature earlier, the female pullet might start laying one egg early, but the delivery of the egg is like a delivery of a baby. It's very obvious, and it looks like a worm coming out, and, and it's blood, and it's red, and the other curious males would pick at that membrane and make blood and kill the bird. <clears throat> so we had to be careful of all these warnings that we learned, that we learned before I went to school. So we had uh, lessons to be learned in the early days. I think I was probably 10-ish because 10 would be 19. I have to, I have to figure this thing out. Uh, I, I think I went to high school in Astoria 
in Woodside, Queens, <clears throat> we moved away from the big house to, to make some more money. My, my mother accepted a job as a, an apartment house manager. My father was getting ill and he couldn't work at all in, in, in Woodside. And so my mother found a job through a friend, 24-unit apartment house in Astoria, right next door to Woodside, Queens. And in that place, the place was filthy, and my mother says, I can clean that up. She worked day and night scrubbing those white marble, you know those little rectangular marble tiles in the olden days? It was all over the place in this apartment house. And, and all the crack, all the edges were black. The previous uh, manager never cleaned it. <clears throat> so she says, I want that job. So she got the boss to fire the previous manager, and she started making money. First of all, we got the apartment free. Two bedroom, one bath in the basement of the apartment house. And we had a dumb waiter which would, would collect trash. And we had, she was doing everything to save our necks. So she would promise the owner to make a, a wonder building, and she did. We were at that 24 unit apartment house. She made it clean. She raised the rents. She got a, a, a salary as well as uh, just free rent. And we use that to buy food. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> let's see. Which of these avenues am I going to pursue? Uh, we, we were in Astoria, Queens, until I was uh, approaching uh, high school, junior high school age. I think I went to Walter Hervey Junior College. Ju no, Walter Hervey. Junior high school. I, I'm not so sure how to spell that, but anyway. Things were moving along. The war was moving along. My father was home in the apartment house, painting a little bit here and there. Not a good job. He wasn't a good tradesman. He wasn't handy with tools. It's all on my mother's back. My wonderful mother did everything. She even painted with my father when an apartment became vacant. She was, she learned how to be a manager. Remember, she only learned what I taught her. Little by little, she started learning how to read the newspaper, but just headlines. She wanted to know what was going on. She would listen to the radio, and little by little, she learned more English. Eventually, she learned how to write a little bit. She would go to <clears throat> night school. The high school had classes. I don't remember all of that. <clears throat> she was always self-improving. So, I guess I should jump to the point where I was raising poultry more and more. I was nearing the end of my deferment. Oh, I'm going to go back and tell you about my father. Being raised in the Adriatic area, he was what well, he called himself a sailor. <clears throat> but not a sailboat sailor. He was <clears throat> an ocean man. He was a, a sea, he was a, a sea man. He loved to, to fish. So he was trying to teach me how to fish. We lived close to, uh, to uh, Long Island Sound. That's just about five miles or less from our home. Long Island Sound is shallow and <clears throat> lots of fish <clears throat> and clams and lots of shellfish. But he started taking me out to the end, east end of Long Island. It's called Montauk Point. M-O-N-T-A-U-K. <clears throat> and there, we would cut the brush and make a spongy kind of a bed. And we would have one truck top, brown, heavy-duty truck top on top, of, on top of the bushes to sleep on. <clears throat> and another one from the car to the ground to shed the rain because it rained a lot. 
And so we would, we would camp once in a while. We would borrow a friend's boat once in a while and go fishing. But I always threw up. It's a history of my childhood <clears throat> is hating the ocean, except I love fish <clears throat> to eat, not to catch. I felt squeamish about taking a hook out of a fish's mouth. I felt sorry for it. There's it, it, a kind of a love that extends too far. Nevertheless, my father kept pushing me to go out to Long Island in Montauk Point to join him in the pleasure and the joy of fishing. So, that established the base for my hating to cross the Atlantic later on in my life. So, all of these episodes continued, and I used to listen to the radio. We didn't have TV, of course. We had a, a little radio, <clears throat> which later on we traded for a big radio, a cabinet radio this big, still a small radio. <clears throat> the first radio we had was a crystal radio with a little wire and a crystal and earphones. But that was hard for us to use. So my father, it was making a little bit of money, he bought a used speaker radio. And I would have my ear there, and I had my own mental stage of all Tom Mix and all the Western guys, and everything converted from my ear to this mental stage. We didn't have TV until, you know, 1951 or something like that. Just a little seven inch, five by seven, which which we used to have our ears next to the speaker. Well, this time we had our eyes next to the screen. But anyway, to us, it was wonderful. It was equivalent because we learned to use our imagination and we developed any kind of smell or noise or setting that, that was appropriate. And I was happy. So... Living, growing, maturing, dancing, eating, camping, throwing up, that was my life. At some point, I started to drive my father's uh, 39 Plymouth, Blue Plymouth, to New York to sell the chickens and eggs to our, fa our family. We had a big family in, in, in Woodside, Queens area. And so we start asking neighbors if they want to order any poultry and eggs for the next week. <clears throat> that was a business mind that came from my mother. Expand business. Don't just sit there. So we, we, we couldn't produce enough eggs. So we would borrow or buy eggs from the neighbors who raised more than they could eat. They would have a sign out, but we would buy those wholesale and candle them. That means you, you look at the yolk through a, a light and you wiggle them to see if there's a blood spot or if there was any imperfection. So we tried to eat as many as we can could uh, of all those imperfect eggs. So as, as I approached the, the day of the, of the, bat, of the uh, draft board, business continued to the point that it was getting hard for me to handle. And so my father left the aircraft factory and he was working with us. I think that was probably 1940-ish, not so sure, but about that time, I was uh, 15, 1940, 25, 35. So uh, things develop, uh, and I have to back up because each of these episodes took time. And so we came to the point 
that uh, business was picking up so much that we had to hire a man to help me and my mother and father on the farm. There's always clean up to do, and there's always disease that comes, and, 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 and the coccidiosis is one of the worst diseases, as well as cannibalism. So cannibalism can be avoided by s uh, separating them, reduce the density. And, and, and the coccidiosis is merely a bird's e eating the, the, the droppings of the other birds, and there's, there's bacteria and disease everywhere, and so it gets more to be more than their immune system can handle, as I learned in school. Okay, so there's a lot of things happening which are making life difficult. So my father hired this guy as I was preparing to, to go back to the draft board, and he was a poor guy and started to steal the money because it was all a cash deal. We would have a, 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 a scale outside. We had a big sign on the farm, fabulous poultry farm on Larkfield Road, L-A-R-K-F-I-E-L-D, as a main drag between Long Island Sound and Jericho Turnpike, which was the east-west Highway 25, I believe. So we had a lot of traffic and a lot of customers. Some of the Southerners, we don't know what, country, what states, but some of the Southerners <clears throat> wanted to kill and slaughtered their own chickens with a grabbing of the head and a whip. That was scary for me to see that because I learned how to put a, a mature chicken. I mean, slaughtering is, is not killing. Slaughtering is, is allowable. It's not murder. It's food. So I learned how to look at attitudes again. There's my key word. Uh, the attitude was do it quickly with the least amount of trauma. So we had a funnel. We would take a bird, grab the feet, put it in the funnel, stick the head out, still alive, and slit the throat. And then take it out, give it to the next person who would dip it into boiling water, hopefully not alive anymore, and that would loosen the feathers, and then hand it to the next person <clears throat> who would have this rotating drum about 12 inches diameter and 24 inches long with <clears throat> a series of one inch thick rubber fingers sticking out, sticking through the, the skin. And as this <clears throat> drum tumbled and the bird was removed from the boiling water, loosening the feathers, the feathers would fly into a collection thing and we ended up with a clean chicken on the outside, which was handed to the next person to eviscerate, to open it up and do that. So that was our production line, which I learned in the school and which we had going for a long time. <clears throat> so we had huge barrels and later on we bought coolers, just ordinary foam coolers. And we would make ice or buy ice at the ice house <clears throat> and never freeze, but just ice <clears throat> the chickens as well as the eggs for the delivery next morning to the city. So that was the business part. And then coming back to the draft board. Okay, so we were told to meet at a local town in <clears throat> Nassau County, that's the middle county of Long Island, N-A-S-S-A-U. <clears throat> there was Brooklyn and Woodside, there was Brooklyn and Queens on the <clears throat> Manhattan end of Long Island, and then it was Nassau and Suffolk. And we had the farm in Suffolk, and we met in, in uh, a draft board in Nassau. <clears throat> so they interviewed us, and they said, 
uh, what kind of work did you do? I said, poultry farming. Ah, farming, tracks. Tracks, armored. So that established where I was headed <clears throat> in the Army, not the Navy, not the Marines, but Army, and in tracks, which means armored, which means Fort Knox, Kentucky, where the gold was stored, which means you all country. So therefore, that was the beginning of that period of my life. And that's, and that's a good place to stop here for a second so I can change this tape out. Did we